I V M. Hey everybody, welcome to another week on the IVM Podcast Network. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Paytm Money Upfront. We're still in lockdown and、uh, we're trying our best to make our releases work, but we are occasionally getting a little late or slipping on some episodes. Hope that you guys continue to remain patient with us. Check out our、uh, social media accounts. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We're doing something over there called the IVM Smart Guide. A bunch of our hosts are talking about things to do during the lockdown: books, movies, podcasts, etc. Check it out. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And、uh, Uh, let's get you onto your show right now. The Republic of India seems to be good at running campaigns, even when routine systems fail horribly. Can India's health systems tackle COVID nineteen in mission mode? Yamini Iyer of the Center for Policy Research joins us on episode one thirty five of the Pragati Podcast to explore this idea. Yamini also gives us some much needed context on the state of our public health and healthcare systems before diving into a discussion on the pandemic response. Before we begin, this episode was recorded at the beginning of the lockdown and is now being released close to three weeks later. My profuse apologies for the delay. Yamini shares key frameworks and ideas on how to go about rallying India's healthcare systems for the pandemic, and they serve as an excellent guide to parse all actions by governments in the country. In some cases, you will see a lag between our discussion that was recorded on the 26th of March and when governments started to act on similar ideas. Indian governments are also yet to act on some of what we discuss. In other themes that we explore, you will see even a stark divergence between the ideas we discuss and what the Indian state actually gets up to. Stay safe, and I hope you keep tuning in. Welcome to the Pragati Podcast, a weekly talk show on public policy, economics, and international relations. We take a step back from noisy political debates and dive into rich conversations on India and the world. I am your host, Pawan Srinath. We'll start this episode's conversation after a short break. Namaste, I am Saurabh Chandra, and I am Pranay Kotesthane. जब महफिल खत्म होते होते दरवाजे के बाहर पुलिया के ऊपर हम दुनिया भर की जटिल समस्याओं को सॉल्व करने में लग जाते हैं, तो हो जाती है पुलिया बाजी. अब आजकल के अपार्टमेंट वालों ने तो कभी पुलिया देखी नहीं होगी पर आप फीलिंग तो समझ ही सकते हैं तो आइए शामिल हो जाइए हमारी पुलियाबाजी में जहाँ प्रणय और मैं एक से एक इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक्स की तह तक जाएंगे आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस बिटकॉइन पाकिस्तान मेडिकल एजुकेशन करेंसी क्राइसिस कभी हम दोनों के साथ और अक्सर स्पेशल एक्सपर्ट गेस्ट की कंपनी में सुनिए हमें आई की वेबसाइट ऐप या अपने फेवरेट पॉडकास्टिंग प्लेटफॉर्म आरोप हर दूसरे हफ्ते Hi, I'm Pavan Shrinath, and welcome to the Pragati Podcast. I'm recording this episode with Yamini Iyer, President and the Chief Executive of the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, easily one of India's best think tanks today. Yamini, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Pavan. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be part of the Pragati Podcast that I have been a long time listener of and admirer of. Thank you so much. We are recording this, unfortunately, under far from the best of times. We are recording this on March twenty sixth, day two of the twenty one day nationwide lockdown to tackle the COVID nineteen pandemic. Yamini, you've been writing incisive articles over the last few days on India's response to this pandemic, and well before that, you've spent years studying India's state capacity and our country's social sector in particular, including our public health and healthcare. And the accountability initiative that you started is something that I and many others have been reading to really understand how money flows, how the government works, and how all. The government may not work. I thought we would start by talking about how I think in India we struggle to differentiate between what government-provided healthcare is and what public health is. So, can you help us get our language and our thinking and our thinking frames correct to begin with, and then we can proceed with the rest of the conversation? Sure, you're right. We do tend to conflate、uh, the two terminologies, and they, in some senses, mean slightly different things.、Uh, and it's not just you and I. I think what is particularly worrying for me, as somebody who has been looking at at the unfolding of our public health systems in India over many years, is that in fact our policymakers conflate the two as well, and inevitably end up prioritizing one over the other. 
So let me just explain. Public health as a term essentially refers to a much broader idea of of health for the population in general. It is talking about our ability to deal with infectious diseases, to deal with sanitation, to deal with hygiene practices. It sort of brings together epidemiology, disease tracking, prevention, and promotion. So it actually is about the entire gamut of things that we need to do to ensure the health and well-being of our population at large. The government-provided health care system refers to the institutional mechanisms by which curative and tertiary care are provided to people. And if you look at India's healthcare system over the last 15 to 20 years, and I would venture so far as to say traditionally, we have focused far more on curative and tertiary care and far less on preventive promotive. So public health has in fact been much less of a priority to the extent that healthcare is a policy priority in India, which itself is a question. But public health has been less of a priority, whereas a government provided healthcare has been a higher priority. Let me also just add one more thing. The reason perhaps we focus less on public health is because public health actually actually is much more than doctors and clinics. Public health is about our municipalities. It is about our sanitation systems. It is about our ability to do disease surveillance. It is about our ability to do publicity, information campaigns, to engage with the population as a whole. It is about our ability to actually create an intersection between our everyday social life, our specific health needs, and the structure of government that enables all of this to happen. Now, Now that for India is extremely hard because it means that you have to have coordinated, cooperative engagement across all levels of government and with society, both civil society and the marketplace. And even as you describe all of it, it feels like a near insurmountable challenge in India. But (laughs) but it is something that many countries have figured out and become better at every year and every decade, right? So it's not Mm -hmm. something that India can't do either. And I think one of the things I think we want to discuss about is how can we do this in this time of crisis? Can it become an opportunity where we fix some things and put some things in place that we haven't been able to do so far? We broadly know that India has a very poor capacity when it comes to public health and even the government provided healthcare. We know that there are too few medical professionals and most of the health expenditure is sort of born out of pocket uh, by Indian households, right? So sometimes, you know, I get confused by these US versus UK type discussions that are happening uh, in India, where we talk about private versus public healthcare and health insurance. And we are in a place where there is neither and there's nothing. A short while back, when I was at the Takshashila Institution, a few colleagues and I, we sort of looked at these health budgets and we found that what India spends just a little over 1% of its GDP on health, all state and central governments combined. And maybe if we add, you know, water and sanitation, nutrition and other things, maybe 1.5%. So could you give us a quick snapshot of, you know, the myriad health systems that we have in India, especially the government ones, before we sort of dive into what we can do on COVID? Sure. Actually, so here's the big challenge with our health system, right? Which is that if you look at the work that my colleague Jishnu Das and others have been doing, one of the things that they have pointed out repeatedly through their surveys in India is that, in fact, while we know that about 80% of uh, health expenditure takes place out of pocket and in the private sector, uh, one often thinks that, in fact, our access to healthcare, public or private, is very thin, especially in rural India and remote parts of the country. Country, right, uh, But Jishnu and his colleagues have repeatedly reminded us that that in fact is actually not quite the case. Between 75% or so of India has access to healthcare, but 86% of those providers are in the private sector. And a significant proportion of those are informal providers, i.e. they are not MBBS qualified doctors. So the sort of Munna Bhai MBBS uh, doctor is very prevalent all over India. And that's where the the bulk of India accesses and receives its healthcare. And I think that the question that we need to be asked 
asking ourselves, especially when we are looking at US versus UK or the larger policy question that we often confront, which is about, you know, whether we should go for universal health care. And that's been, of course, the big push. In some strange way, India has universal health, as in a lot of Indians have access to health care. The problem is that India doesn't have high quality, well qualified health care practitioners and access to those high quality, well qualified health care practitioners. One of the funny things that the government system does for India is that it actually brings in well qualified health care practitioners into the Indian health system. It does so through its network of the primary health care centers, the sub centers, the CHCs, the district hospitals, and so on. But as Jishnu and his colleagues have reminded us repeatedly, getting the healthcare system up, building the clinic, uh, getting the doctor allocated to the clinic doesn't necessarily mean that the doctor is in fact going to be providing high quality healthcare to people who are coming there. And that to me, more than budgets and anything else, and we'll come to the budgets in a minute, but that to me is a fundamental core challenge of our health system, which is around creating a health system environment in which doctors actually do their jobs. Here are some numbers for listeners who don't follow the minutiae of India's health system. But, you know, over the years, Jishnu Das, Jeff Hammer, and many others who've been studying doctor and provider behavior have pointed out to us repeatedly that A, doctor absenteeism is a significant issue. Even though you may have a health center and you may have a doctor allocated to it, uh, the chances of the doctor actually showing up in the clinic on an appointed day, absenteeism rates countrywide are at a, within the range of about 40%. And secondly, even if you show up as a patient and the doctor happens to be there, there is a 50-50% chance that the diagnosis, the prescription will be accurate. In fact, <laughs> some of the early comparisons with provider behavior in Delhi, with Tanzania and Indonesia found that essentially government doctors in Delhi are more qualified, but put less effort and the chances of a correct diagnosis are lower than doctors in rural Tanzania and in rural Indonesia. And this is not because the doctors themselves are unqualified or incompetent. It is because of the incentive structure. And many of these doctors also run private clinics and uh, use their private clinics as places where they actually give diagnosis and prescriptions to patients. So in some strange way, the government health system serves as a referral system for MBBS doctors' private practice. And if it wasn't for the government system, you actually wouldn't have the MBBS doctor coming into far-flung parts of India. And we've struggled with this for years in many different parts of India. How do you actually get doctors, nurses, and providers to show up to get the job done? And one of the funny things is that, of course, in India, and I'm sure we'll talk about it when we talk about state capacity, Capacity, every time we think that the system is not working, our first reaction is, how do you monitor and enforce better, right? So there's a really interesting study of in Karnataka, a randomized control trial done by Rima Hana and others. And one of the things they did was experiment with biometric attendance systems in health centers and hospitals. You know, I mean, it was a complicated study and I won't get into the details because we have many other things we want to discuss here. But the interesting thing that came out from that was that even as in the initial phase, Phases, doctors showed up more frequently and footfall into the government system increased. At some point, that footfall shifted over into the private system. So there is also, because of the complexity of our health system, a very complex relationship that citizens and patients, I guess, have with the government health system and with the private health system. And it's not one that can be easily differentiated as we tend to do in debates about public versus private, regulation versus provider. It is a very complex dynamic that unfolds in the everyday experiences and behaviors of patients, uh, doctors, governments, and private practitioners. And we need to th understand that before we think about what is the right kind of health system to have for India, combined with the fact to refer to our earlier discussion about public health versus government-provided public health, is that we do much less on the preventive promotion and much more on the curative tertiary, which essentially means people need a lot more health care than they should if we had put our energies far better on the promotion preventive side of things. 
And this is so important because now with a lot of new type of insurance schemes, say the Ayushman Bharat idea and so on, it feels like there's this serious risk that once an illness becomes sufficiently serious that you need hospitalization, that is when people go seek treatment because, you know, maybe there is a way to get the government to sort of pay for it. No, absolutely. And then you add into that the complications of insurance and regulatory structures and incentive systems, you know, it's it's not impossible to do. And in fact, many states have tried to, especially with the rise of non-communicable diseases in India, the need for insurance uh, is, is critical and one shouldn't undermine that. But, you know, we have to be thinking through the complexities of these dynamics of the relationship between patients and the health system and added into that when markets come in, how do you ensure that you regulate this whole process in a way that the patient doesn't get over-treated, uh, which can certainly happen in an insurance system. Uh, And that means we have to think about pricing. We have to think about uh, enforcement. I mean, it's complex. And, you know, uh, the knee-jerk state capacity reaction in India always is when there's a problem, either take in a biometric or start out a new scheme. (laughs) And so, in fact, you know, you mentioned about in the Indian government spend, which is just about over 1% of GDP. The problem is both that we spend way too little for a country like ours, uh, but also how we are spending. So where are you prioritizing? After all, policymaking is about determining what you want to prioritize and why. And it's also about the fragmentation. So, you know, what's happened in 2004-05, the government focused on the NHRM, the National Health uh, Rural Mission, which has subsequently become the National Health Mission. And there, there was a fairly concerted focus on trying to build a health system, starting from the primary health center, all actually starting from the village at the community level with the ASHA worker, all the way up to the hospitals. And the input that was going in, it was basically about building the health infrastructure. But the input that was going in was largely about government building itself up as a provider. And that's where the bulk of the money was. We experimented a little bit with insurance through the Rashtriya Swastha Bhima Yojana uh, as well. And then, of course, state governments were doing uh, a bunch of other things at their level as well. But NHM sort of became the dominant framework. In the last four or five years, in fact, even before the launch of the Ayushman Bharat, the focus sort of started shifting a little bit towards insurance-based schemes. And as a result, what we've ended up with is a lot of fragmentation. So there, there is a one stream of funding that is going for health systems. There's one street of stream of funding that's going for uh, wellness centers linked to Ayushman Bharat. There's another stream of funding that is sort of trying to build up some kind of a triage between state insurance programs linking back up to the Ayushman Bharat. So, you know, it's become very fragmented, which makes it very difficult uh, to actually have a systems-based holistic approach to the challenge. And let's not forget that even though we finally started taking some elements of public health seriously through Swachh Bharat, Swachh Bharat is not integrated even sort of bureaucratically and administratively into our health system. There's a different ministry with a different line of operation that handles the entire Swachh Bharat. And the the link between the gram panchayats, the district panchayats and municipalities into the health system to build in sanitation into a public health structure, it's very, very weak. So our sort of a budgetary challenge is both a challenge of very, very low budget allocations, but also allocations made in a very fragmented way that make a systems-based approach much harder and an integrated approach of public health leading into curative tertiary far more difficult to achieve. And I hope we'll talk about spending at some point because that's an issue too. Uh, certainly, I mean, I mean, in the context of all of this, it makes so much sense. Even those of us with privilege who are living in cities and are reasonably well off, makes so much sense that when we go to our neighborhood pharmacy, the pharmacy becomes a place of dispensing medical advice, right? Because many people, the cost of just getting a prescription, even to get an antibiotic or something, while we have an antibiotic overuse problem and many other challenges, it makes so much sense that people just walk up to a pharmacy and get fever medication, get antibiotics and get many other medicines because any other way to afford it becomes incredibly expensive. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. By the way, just a small point here. Some of Jishnu's work, I think it's in West Bengal. A lot of the, you know, a lab assistants, people working in pharmacies, they are the ones who then become the informal providers that people that, that most poor uh, Indians go to for healthcare. So they are becoming quite central to our entire health system, not public health system. Absolutely. And, and you talked about the incentives for doctors and governments. And the other part is also that there is this huge asymmetry of information between doctors and patients, right? I mean, right. We, we have to trust the medical system and individuals and doctors and so on and trust the advice and hope they are treating as well and not over treating us or, you know, just treating symptoms and not the underlying cause. And there are all these issues. And now suddenly, if you're saying, you know, there is this pandemic that is sweeping through the country and the government is going to step in and they're going to ask you to self-quarantine or they might quarantine you, Suddenly, in this backdrop that we are in, people are being asked to trust the state that the state will take care of them and safeguard them from a pandemic, right? I'm sure that a lot of challenges and friction will rise just out of that. People are scared. The stories we are seeing of people fleeing quarantine and so on, while they are tragic, and sometimes it's easy to blame people who are doing so, and sometimes there might be malintent. It is very easy to imagine deep distrust of the state when it comes to health provision. Yeah, I think in the COVID time, those challenges just become a lot more acute. So in these extraordinary times, so one of the things that you've been writing about is how while India is very poor at dealing with a lot of these chronic issues and necessarily fixing these systems and building these systems when there is perhaps not that much urgency. The Indian state has been able to rise up to the challenge and work on things in a mission mode in the past. Mm -hmm. Whether we look at the Kumbh Yatra or even sort of the Pulse Polio campaign, which went beyond a mission mode and just sustained for a very long time even, we've been able to successfully combat a few things. In fact, if my reading is right, I think at one point India took very serious action on malaria and from the millions of people it was affecting every year, drastically reduced the size. But I think once it got to a certain size, then, you know, the state lost interest. And now malaria is one of, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 100 infectious diseases that are just there in the Indian ecosystem, along with dengue and everything else. And that's sort of where we are. So now with COVID coming in as a pandemic, how do you see the state at its best marshalling its various resources and tackling this on mission mode? <laughs> I had made this point and it is quite, it's one of the big puzzles of the Indian state, right? Which is how is it that we are able to do things in mission mode and the minute they have to get routinized, the system just fails. And in fact, a lot of my current ongoing research on the Indian state is really trying to understand the puzzle of this question. But if you look at uh, occasions where we have been successful, it usually happens when you align goals, a very clearly specified set of actions and outcomes and gear up the system into sort of short term mission mode. That's what we want to do. Uh, I'm sure that's how our governments are thinking about it, although uh, sitting from the outside observing it's, uh, I, I have to say that right now it's looking a lot more confused than it should at this stage. But there's still things that we can do. To get those done, let me first talk about the health system and then we'll get to others. First things foremost, hospital preparedness, right? There have already been very clear instructions that are coming out from the government of India level as well as uh, at the state level for expansion of beds, for preparing large stadia, etc, etc. But some very quick important things need to be taken into account, uh, which make implementation at the grassroots level difficult in India, which is all the bottlenecks of spending, which are about administrative procedures, administrative processes and red tape. So if you look at our national health mission budget, you'll find that in fact, India consistently underspends uh, in terms of budget allocations. Our Last year, 1819, we spent only about 59% of our total national health mission budget. One of the, those reasons is that government of India tends not to release money, especially in times when it's fiscally constrained. But even when money is available, it sits in uh, as unspent balances and bank accounts across the country because of the complicated red tape that needs to be gone through. Perhaps it's necessary. That's a conversation for another day. Uh, but it, there is complications in spending. We need to just loosen up our protocols. We need to be able to change, for, you know, gear into mission mode and just tell hospitals. So at the district level, there's a 
the chief medical officer, just tell them, you know, go out and do spend for what you need. And that that includes uh, ensuring beds, cleanliness of hospitals. You know, we saw all these pictures of the quarantine centers that people were posting on Twitter and many were running away from because of the poor quality of facilities. Well, you know, the average district hospital in India looks like that. So, so, you know, we need to sanitize, we need to create isolation wards, we need to get our ventilators going, we need to make all these purchases. That stuff needs to happen. It needs to happen now. It needs to happen on mission mode. And to do this, we need to have a coordination mechanism from center to state, from state to district. That's number one. Number two, we should have been testing. We shouldn't have got here had we followed the WHO norm of test, 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 and test sensibly, of course. Uh, For whatever reason, we haven't done that. We've loosened the protocols. Private sector is finally coming in. Hopefully, we'll be able to test more. Uh, What we do know is that the disease tends to break out in clusters and in, 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 in centers, right? So if we have a better way, a much more agile system of identifying where community transmission is beginning to happen, and build an inventory by mapping our health facilities, very quick, very easy to do, and be able to create a mechanism where districts, states, and center can coordinate with each other to move doctors uh, to areas where they are most needed. Now, here's another important statistic, again, borrowing from Jishnu's work, which is that in much of rural India, of course, there's state variation, but in much of rural India, the average MBBS doctors uh, during his uh, official work hours uh, when he's running or she is running the clinic, sees about eight to 10 patients per day. Wow. So the workload is not so high. Just eight to 10. Just eight to 10. Amazing. Yeah. So the, I mean, maybe they see a lot more in their private clinics in the evening, but you know, the workload is not as high at any given point. And if we do it sensibly, there are ways of ensuring that at least nurses are there and other systems are put in place right. uh, to ensure that those who need the health system can access it and doctors can become more mobile. In fact, if you look at at Wuhan, you know, one of the things that happened very early is that, you know, China just mobilized its doctors from all over and brought them all over. This stuff is very easy to do. We just need to gear up, get prepared and get going. Thank you, Yamini, for highlighting this. And I don't think it can be highlighted enough because we always lament the fact that we have too few doctors in the country and fewer doctors in the government system. But what you're saying is the doctors who are there, the medical professionals who are there outside of well-functioning tertiary hospitals that are tier one and tier two, there is still a lot of slack in the system. There is more sort of work that can be done. So marshalling and mobilizing the human resources within the existing government healthcare system itself can give us far more dramatic results, right? And that's something that is being missed out a lot in the public conversation. Yeah. And let's not forget that the reason why they are not being utilized as well as they should be is because of failures in our system. But for the moment, let's take our failures and just get them and use them to our advantage because we have to get into a serious mission mode. And then, of course, there's been quite a lot uh, of thinking um, and action actually on the part of governments mobilizing our grassroots community based workers, especially the ASHAs, to serve both as, you know, uh, building awareness and engaging with the community and to also take care of other healthcare needs. After all, their women are delivering babies, there's all sorts of other things, you know, the usual health uh, routine, non-pandemic related issues that India confronts on a daily basis. But they can also be used to help patients navigate the health system. Because after all, one of the big concerns is that, you know, especially the poor, they don't really know where, where all they need to go right. so that you don't overburden the hospital immediately. So don't get to a hospital first. We also have built in the last two years a network of wellness centers uh, as part of Ayushman Bharat. Again, those may not have the ability to function as substitute hospitals or anything, but they can serve as fever clinics like China had, which would also help us quite a lot. So I think in some, what I'm trying to say is that at this point, while we are all being locked down and everybody is being told social distancing, social distancing, social distancing, if we are doing social distancing to buy time, then it's very, very critical for the government to on mission mode 
prepare and uh, mobilize the health system. I'm sure they're already doing it. And I hope that our historical mission mode ability comes into full action and gets going. Of course, health is more difficult than disaster relief uh, because it's much more transaction intensive by nature of what it is. And the nature of this pandemic itself is complicated. Uh, We've also found that we haven't been able to get basic things to doctors, the PPE story that's doing the rounds these days, you know, to ensure that doctors are well protected. And by the way, that's the last thing I just want to say. We must also make sure that we are putting in some mechanisms for testing of doctors. A lot of the community transmission in Wuhan, for instance, I mean, uh, started with doctors. They are also at the front lines and in fact, much more vulnerable. And that should also be part and parcel of the protocols that we are developing for who we are testing, how and when. If we have too many medical professionals who are incapacitated in this time, apart from perhaps even spreading it to their families and others, then then we are in deep trouble, right? Because we need our medical professionals and those who are running our essential services to be able to operate safely and widely. And so that the rest of us, even if we are on lockdown, are able to get the food and the necessities that we need for this. So I, I want to come to numbers in a bit, but two follow up questions on mission mode thinking. You already really highlighted to this point about how we perhaps need to enable people at the lowest level to take as many risks and decisions as possible, right? By risk, I mean, if you need to buy four ceiling fans for your hospital so that you can cool a certain area, you should be allowed to. If you need to buy beds, you should be allowed to. Usually things that take a lot of red tape and a lot of higher level permission. But how else do you see state governments and local governments playing a larger role? We've already seen a lot of variance in how different states have been responding at different speeds to the disease. We've seen some great initiatives come out of Kerala and out of other states. So how do you see states taking a a role in this, especially given that health is a state subject, even if things like natural disasters or disasters like a pandemic might come under, you know, the union jurisdiction under law. As you rightly point out, there has been a lot of variability in state responses and inevitably states with more robust uh, public health systems. Kerala stands out just by miles and miles uh, relative to the rest of India on this one, I have to say, although some other states are also mobilizing and getting things going very, very well. And this is also, of course, a very much a factor of our historic ability to mobilize our systems. I think at this point, the most important important thing to do for the center is to create a coordination committee. I will say that I think it was absurd that our prime minister spoke to the nation. I think it was on the 20th and only had the first at least public uh, discussion with state chief ministers and chief secretaries the next day. Uh, There should be a, a center state coordination committee right now. I hope there is fully functional, well equipped that is sharing information so that Bihar can learn a little bit from what Kerala did. And while Bihar waits for community transmission, hopefully it will not happen. But as it develops its own preparedness plans, it can learn from the different things that Kerala has done. Kerala has, for instance, mobilized its Kudumbashri's uh, self-help groups. Now, Bihar has the Jivika mission, which has sort of tried to replicate some version of the self-help group structure. So there's a large network of women's uh, organizations. All that data is sitting somewhere with the Bihar government. What are the best ways in which they can mobilize? What is the role that the SAGs can play? There's so much learning to be had so that we can actually ensure that then Bihar does what makes sense for Bihar, given Bihar's own healthcare capabilities, right? Let's also not forget that every state has a, its health systems at very different levels of capacity, capability, and maturity. It will need to design a mission mode intervention right now to respond to the challenge it faces based on what its health systems are capable of. Don't Don't do a uniform, here are the 10 things you have to do, do them now and I'm giving you the uh, budget line items to do it kind of mechanism that bureaucrats and governments in India love doing. I think right now we should really see how we can leverage states at the level at which their public health systems are. So Delhi has Mohalla clinics, which are really, really an important innovation that can be used right now in innovative ways. Delhi also being a, you know, Delhi, Bombay, many, uh, all our metropolitans have a large private sector network that can be mobilized in different ways, which you won't find, you know, maybe in Ranchi and Patna. So what we need is coordination, learnings, protocols that are shared fast and quickly and a mobilized support that has been given to states that need it most, especially in northern India where health systems are weaker. 
Thank you so much, Yamin. Mean, the second thing, so just like we need the center state coordination, how all do you see the private sector being roped in? If I were to use a war metaphor, I think Ratan Roy has been writing some powerful pieces about how we should be thinking of our economy as a war economy, right? The way the normal modes of production get redirected towards war effort, we probably need to do that the same towards a much more noble cause than most wars, which is fighting this pandemic. Uh, You know, my sense is that at this point in time, everyone is ready uh, to just get going. They are waiting to know what they can do. And of course, uh, let's not undermine the problem from the government side as well, which is that we don't have regulatory capacity. We know that the private sector tends to be predatory. That isn't something that we can completely dismiss. And it's in that context that uh, thinking through we need to just egg the government on. And I think basically government needs to realize if if 86% of India is accessing healthcare in the private sector, everyone from the informal provider and the lab technician and the quack who we mostly don't like, but have some level of experience uh, all the way up to, uh, you know, sophisticated doctors in, uh, in AIMS all need to be mobilized. This has to be a public-private response. It cannot possibly be just a public response. And I think that government also needs to now shed its hesitation. We are in war mode. There will be lots of mistakes that we make uh, as we go along. There's no doubt. But the common goal and common aim is one of arriving at a system preparedness so that we minimize fatalities as things unfold. I think one of the challenges that government is facing right now is in terms of its messaging, which seems to be very much civil society and citizens need to look after themselves and government is sort of doing whatever else it's doing. What message should be sent out is civil society, private sector and government all need to come together to battle this collectively as a whole. So our prime minister has an incredible ability to communicate to people. He has an incredible ability to get us to do things that would be unheard of and unimagined. After all, we are sitting in our homes for 21 days, not a small amount of time. And if he can also deploy his incredible communication to everyone to say, we need you. We are open to having you come together. Let's fight this together. I think you'll see everyone getting ready to help with absolutely no coercion. Private sector has repeatedly said they are ready. I think there are now talks between private sector and government in a more formal way to see what needs to be done next. And I'm hopeful that things will move fast. Thank you, Yamini. I I share the hope and I think The actions and what we see in the next two weeks, I think might determine a lot of whether we can, India can really get into this mission mode or not, right? Because I think if we miss a window of the next few weeks, then we don't know how bad things could get. So in all of this, COVID-19 in India is still one thing that is causing a strain, causing a health problem and a health crisis, right? I mean... Already there are reports of how mm, ICUs and private hospitals are already inundated with patients suffering from other respiratory illnesses like H1N1, like influenza and so on. And and we have enough of a non-communicable disease burden load uh, in India. You have enough people suffering from various chronic illnesses. So we need to figure out how to keep that system chugging along, at least at status quo compared to earlier, right? Because then what happens is we might do a decent job of managing COVID, but there might be a massive opportunity cost and a massive side effect where you know, many lives and uh, may be lost for all other health reasons. Including hunger and starvation, let's not forget. Absolutely. This 21-day lockdown. Absolutely. I I, I wanted to go there. I mean, that sounds scarier. But first, we have to figure out how to at least keep health systems going and then keep all our supplies, all our systems going and and incomes going for people so that they can do what they absolutely have to. Right. It's an important challenge. And in fact, uh, you know, I think it was Dr. Sundaraman who first pointed this out uh, in the public domain that post the monsoon season, or actually during the monsoon season, so July onwards is when the viral season really hits India. So across the country, you get dengue, you get chikungunya, you get H1N1, all kinds of regular viruses that are part and parcel of daily life. You know, so living in Delhi, for instance, from uh, mid-July onwards, even though it's 
hot and sweaty. We all wear long sleeves because we don't want to get dengue. We don't want to get bitten by mosquitoes. So at that point, in fact, the system overburden is going to be even more significant because people will be coming in for all these uh, other diseases that tend to outbreak at that point in time in addition to COVID, which will probably also be spreading uh, at that stage as well. And so we really have to, on a walk footing, prepare the system. I think we need to think about this in two ways. There is the immediate challenge of the next 21 days, which is sort of seems to be our government's understanding of the number of days that we need to, uh, uh, we have in our hands to prepare and to contain, followed by what happens when normal life comes back and what the epidemiology of the disease then looks like, the spread of the disease looks like at that stage, followed by the July surge when in any case hospitals are going to be overburdened because that's what tends to happen. And we need to have a carefully determined, graded approach to the whole problem. Right now, for the next 21 days, my sense is as so A, we push back everything that is elective. Even at some point, even elective surgeries, it won't be viable to push them back. But hospitals are sort of saying anything that is not absolutely critical is not going to be dealt with. But again, this is where the army of community health workers nurses. And I know that governments and public health specialists hesitate to engage with informal providers, but they are there. You know, basic protocols, training, all of this can be done online very, very quickly, mobilizing the Anganwadi worker, everybody at the front lines. Teachers, by the way, huge resource that can be used right now, schools are closed, right? Government school teachers, there are a large number, you know, giving them basic training on enabling people to navigate the health system so that only those who are in absolute critical need make it into tertiary care. I think that will help quite a lot. And then we have to deal with the lulls and the July phase, uh, which we can come to after we get past these 21 days. And and eventually, uh, I don't think that from the COVID point of view, that there's any getting around the challenge of test, 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 because that's the only way we'll manage the lull and be able to handle the next surge if it were to come better. I'm happy that at least on the test count, we are seeing some positive news over the last, I think just last few days where finally I think private labs are being roped in. I think they're fast tracking the approval of various indigenously developed uh, diagnostic kits because they're not necessarily available in the quantities that we need from abroad. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that continues ramping up and the size of the solution actually matches the size of the problem uh, and on that count and hopefully the same with all subsequent interventions as well. So yeah, I mean, thank you so much. Now I'm going to ask what might be a difficult question, which is the money for all of this. We, from an economic point of view, COVID-19 has hit us when we have been at our weakest, right? Tax revenues of the government have been the least buoyant and if not stagnating or declining, we've been in the worst spot in probably two decades now. So how do we mobilize the resources in terms of just money to make this happen, to do everything that we need to do? So I think at this point, we should not worry about all the usual things that we worry about, right? Let's stop worrying about fiscal deficits. Let's stop worrying about everything. uh, And let's just have a much more, much clearer sense of what it's going to cost and find ways of uh, of financing that. Uh, I think expenditure switching, which is a sort of public finance term for how you do this, is what is the need of the hour. Governments, I think both at the center and the state level, we need to sit down and say, what is it that we need to prioritize right now? What are, what are absolutely essential tasks of, you know, whether it is in terms of CapEx, our infrastructure projects and so on, whether it is in terms of many other social spending uh, and find ways of reallocating budget so that the health system has the money it needs. The way I would design this is, again, uh, the center should not get into this national health mission mode of thousand line items and telling states what to do. They should create an untied pool of money. They should also bring into this untied pool of money the disaster relief, the prime minister's disaster relief fund, all the CSR money that is coming that government collects, which you know was going into things like the Swachh Bharat Posh and a few other places. All that should come. Luckily, 
oil gives us a bonanza and put all of that into a health fund, a disaster health fund or a corona health fund or whatever it is. The World Bank is also, I think, committed quite a large uh, amount of funds for this as well. And there are two expenditure priorities that we have to have for the next two to three months. Firstly, expenditure priority for preparing the health system. I believe that that's a, from a forward looking perspective, even beyond this immediate crisis, that is going to yield very positive results. Because as we started this conversation by saying that we don't spend much on health, our health infrastructure is broken, our health system doesn't function. This is going to be investment well spent for the future. So if the government has to break its fiscal deficit targets at this point for that, it is still an investment that will yield positive results going forward as it enables better human capital. And then of course, the second place where we need to spend our money on is in ensuring that we have a a well-resourced social protection mechanism in place and some kind of bailout so that the economy can kickstart itself when the lockdowns are are over and the challenges of the immediate uh, are past us, that the poor are taken care of in the immediate before they are then able to get to a place where they can participate actively in the economy. Yamini, thank you so much for taking out the time and joining me to talk about this today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me and uh, look forward to, to another conversation in happier times. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us till the end. If you have any questions or comments, do write in to podcast at thinkpragati.com. And hey, if you like the podcast and listen to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and a review. It will mean a lot to us. The Pragati Podcast is available on the IVM Podcast app and pretty much every other podcast app and platform. We are there everywhere. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, the show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance, from stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. robo advisory, startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM Podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Hey everybody, we have a brand new podcast series by Bloomberg Quint called BQ Conversations which covers a range of topics like business strategies, latest trends in technology such as cybersecurity and artificial intelligence, and also personal finance. Episodes are out on the IVM Podcast app or wherever you listen to podcasts.